let's give any one of them so that the uh, the overall uh, risk is relatively low but you can and and then that means there's more willingness to borrow and this becomes twistedly the way that guys like uh, Clinton uh, imagine they're going to fix the black home ownership problem because we talk about those GIs who got that sweet deal after World War II uh, African Americans were pointedly uh, redlined out of that deal, and the difference to this day in uh, wealth between the average white and black American is about the cost, at least it used to be, of, of one home. Uh, and, in, you know, uh, in a average uh, market. And, of course, you know, uh, the old days of direct provision, that's not happening. Of course, we never build public housing. But instead, what we'll do is we'll create these new uh, collateralized mortgage systems that allow for things like uh, adjustable rate mortgages, which are much uh, riskier, higher profit margin and incentive for the uh, for the, for the lender. Uh, for example, the borrower is one is that rate stays low. Uh, and then back behind these... Uh, and then finally, this is allowed to happen because of the fact that Freddie and Fat, Freddie Mac and Fannie Mae, these quasi-government organizations, are backing these transactions and making tons of money off of swapping these things and acting as like a, uh, a clearinghouse for all these uh, new federally secured mortgages that are on much, much, much flimsier economic basis than previous ones have been. Because you know, you're not giving somebody a 30 rate fix, a 30 year fix to somebody who's got a factory job. We're now talking about people who are working much more uh, uh, unpredictably, whose income is much more vulnerable, who uh, have more debt, that's a huge part of it, who have more debt other than uh, a mortgage. And are now just being told, okay, yeah, uh, good luck. You can afford X, X amount, but if it goes up, uh, you're going to And of course, many of them weren't told that. Uh, so Fannie and Freddie are, are backing, in, in the 1980s, they backed 70% of mortgages in America. And by 2007, it's 45%. Uh, and so in this context, though, house values just go up because demand is through the roof. And of course, supply is, is sort of constrained at relatively. Like, we stopped building houses in this country in the 70s. If you look at the chart, it's stunning. Um, so house prices in the 2000s go up 60% over inflation, which is the most since the war. Uh, and what this means, though, is that there's this new type of instrument that has this uh, highly rated, secure, it's related to the American housing economy, which is related to the American consumer economy, which undergirds the entire thing. This is as uh, a sure thing as, as buying treasuries is. Uh, and that means there's a huge rush of foreign money into the, Amer into the American uh, real estate market. Uh, because of the interdependence of these systems now. I mean, the money's got to go somewhere. There's, there's profits to be had here to draw uh, money to, towards it. And there's all this money sitting piling that cannot be profitably invested elsewhere because the rate of profit is going down because the structural inputs have degraded. The eternal footman is at your coat. He's snickering. But of course, the system can't acknowledge that. It just goes into overdrive. Sure, we have to keep eating our seed corn, dissolving all the social bonds that allow this thing to go. Whatever, because there is no alternative. Um. So finally, when the crisis comes, it's not because of any structural problem. It's not because of any crisis in the production process. It's simply that this is a highly speculative economy that is therefore highly volatile. But in such a context, when you have this uh, this key component, this key uh, investments, this this key. Um, this key input, let's call it that, in the form of like these, this continued flow of, uh, of money into this mortgage system. Uh, 
all these mortgages, all this money goes flowing to people's bank accounts, to, to all these institutions. That, that capillary action upward from the people buying uh, and swapping and, and uh, borrowing against homes and all this stuff, all these flows of money plus interest that are going through the system. Uh, it goes kink. The whole thing collapses internationally. One of the big reasons that a lot of people thought that there could never be uh, a crisis that there was in 2008 is because there was a belief, people don't talk about it anymore, but there was a common understanding among economics that there could not be a national housing crisis, that there is no such thing as a national housing market, because Markets are determined by conditions in their local area, location, 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 Econom economics in local areas, which shift, you know? I mean, we talk about how the, the um, American Middle West was hollowed out by deindustrialization, but the Southwest was built, the Sun Belt. It was not just a destruction somewhere, it was building elsewhere. Of course, built in the waste, hospitable place where nobody else went before because it wasn't where you go. But of course, that's the only place left, so that's where we gotta go. What's that? We need to fucking have ACs running 24 hours in every fucking home, and we need to have uh, fucking water pumped in from thousands of miles away. We gotta create fake aqueducts to, to steal water from other states. Sure. What could go wrong? It's the only place we can put the money, though, because it can't stay there, because we build it around these structures that are no longer cost-effective. we got to build this stuff. And they did. They built Phoenix. Wonderful. Great idea. They destroyed Cleveland. They destroyed mid-century marvels with some fantastic uh, architecture, and they built glass cubes in the desert. Fantastic. So all you got is a kink in the house. People stop, people stop being able to afford their mortgages. They're all, everybody is, every one of these people is juggling every day. Something hits, it collapses the entire fucking house. So when this happens, I'm gonna, I'm not gonna belabor this too much. This, they go through like a point by point thing of how the Fed and the Treasury responded, but I don't remote most of this stuff. It all boils down to, then the Treasury came in and just gave everybody money. Bought everybody's bad debt. It's pretty simple. You got bad debt, we're buying it. Of course, the bad debt and the people who took bad mortgages, they gotta get out of the house. They still have to be. And of course, this is the original sin of the Obama administration. This is, this is where everything else flows from. The decision to uh, capitalize the, the borrowers or the, the lenders and dispossess, literally dispossess the uh, borrowers. And it's just because we live in a capitalist system. Like, it could be no other way. And uh, like Obama could have done it, technically. Man, no man gets to Obama. He was always that, we just didn't know. Uh, he has a tragic view of history, which means that he has given up the idea that humans can control their own affairs. He is at the same mind, metaphysically, as, as all of the billionaire class that he hangs out with, uh, and the unspoken voice of our popular culture in general, that is through our um, machineries of, of cultural reinforcement. There can be no social life, so we have to uh, build technologies of distance. So... The fact, though, that this is, this is a, a political process that has to go through the political hoops and, and people have different like levels of understanding of what's going on, it means that the response is not instantaneous. The way it was in 2020 when the economy collapsed right at the beginning of COVID, 
And that was an instantaneous infusion. And that's why we didn't get a Great Recession again in 2020, because it was instantaneous. The reason we got the Great Collapse of 2008 is that there was this, uh, there was this uh, period when the response had to be gathered, and they had to get votes together, and, 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 and sign legislation, and all this, but there's no legislation in 2020. Oh, what, some fucking thing that passed immediately without anybody even looking at it? And this is, this is a perfect example of how capitalism works. You have the Great Depression, which is a huge catastrophe, go on, goes on horrifically long, leads to world war, the death of hundreds of people. Bad, flat, horrible. If you can prevent it, please do. 2008, we had another huge shock to the global system. And the intervention, it's not fast enough to stop it from stop there being a decline in the economy and a suffering, but it does prevent the prolonged, sustained downward trajectory that you had in the 30s. Uh, and then, by 2020, they streamlined it and undemocratized the process so much that it happens behind doors instantaneously, basically as a function of the nervous system. And you have no conflict, nothing ever. And so, at every point, you can say as a capitalist, look at this. Look, at the system adapting, it's beautiful. We're reducing, the, we're reducing the violence of the system. We're reducing the inherent instability of capitalism. Okay, but what are you building as you're doing that? We went from 1929 till uh, 2018 to have the first one, the, to have the first one and then the second one. Then we went from 2008 to 2020. When the hell is the next one going to come then? And where do you go from maximum liquidity as the only response, which there is no alternative to so while they're figuring this stuff out and like Lehman Brothers are going bust and they're not, and they're, they're, they're figuring out what the package is gonna be and they're begging Have guys to lend money. And they're basically the, the, the global banking system everything. is dependent on liquidity provided by uh, drug money, basically. It is, um, it is laundered black market money, mostly like cartel coke money that is still in the system, is still within the system as liquid that can be used for transactions. And while this is happening, there's a 40% drop in the S&P, 3.3 million people lose their jobs, households lose 14 trillion dollars in net worth, there's an 8% drop in retail, 17% drop in capital investment, and GM loses 30 billion dollars. And everybody else in the rest of the world is lashed to the mast of this fucking ship. Everybody else has a cascading crisis in their economies, their own uh, collapses, their own bailouts that have to happen. Uh, in all of this, the, the reaction effect that pulls everything closer, even though it's heightening the contradictions of crisis, pulls in more U.S. dollars. Even in this context, the U.S. dollar is stronger because there's no good investment out there. Everyone's terrified of lending money. So where do they put their money? American Treasury bonds. The last resort investment. Because it's the U.S. state. Without it, there's nothing. So even though I doubt everything else, I still believe in the country with the giant military, the world's largest military, with the most nuclear bombs, at least the best ones. We have the best pieces. Russia might have more of a guy. He has no friends. stimulus package. Every country uh, sort of obligated to, to, to try to stimulate their in, in economy. So, and, and essentially, the global Keynesianism after the working class have left the stage of it. Because Keynesianism assumes uh, a working class uh, Now we post that. We're post Keynes in the sense that we're post uh, working class political power. So in that context, pro the, the, pro the pump priming you know, the kind of, uh, the kind of investment that the uh, of course. state did in the 30s is replaced. It's not hiring people to do jobs directly. It is cutting taxes, and it's giving free money to banks. It's pouring it at the top, because they're the only people who have political power anymore. 
Interestingly enough, do this in different ways. So China yes, doesn't do that. Friends. China doesn't give a bunch of money to the top people. China mail. puts out a bunch of money to smaller businesses in the form of time in uh, bank loans, and then spends a trillion dollars on infrastructure. I heard he was up on the roof This is where you don't know goddamn fucking flashlight. Uh, mad love trains that we're all in there to see every day. He's always on the sling. In America, that money was building building mostly there. tax cuts. It was some direct uh, payment, mostly through. Uh, contracts, no like WPA style thing. We have a right to know. <laughs> Which, you know, actually does encourage uh, working class uh, mobilization. Nope, just diffuse through the system and then a bunch of tax cuts. And then on top of that, uh, quantitative motherfucking easing. On top of it all, more money, liquidity, baby. This is basically the same thing that like Zimbabwe did. But the thing is, is that if you're another country, if you're not America, and you try to increase, uh, you know, uh, uh, to uh, increase like standards of living in your country by or even, you know, maintaining them by printing more money, then you will be punished. You will get hyperinflation. You will get down. But America, the indispensable nation, cannot be disciplined from outside of global capitalism. It doesn't make sense. So, the, the Fed creates this infinite liquidity, uh, which is what allowed for the instantaneous, uh, the instantaneous placing of the finger in the dike in 2020. There's not any backlash internationally because they, uh, other countries can There is no point in punishing the United States because you cannot undermine the system that is the cornerstone of it, at least until now. Now, post-Trump, it's an interesting place, so we'll talk about that. Um, these countries now, because of this cheap dollar, they're stuck with cheap, with less valuable dollar uh, assets.
the global capitalism that it is absolutely dependent upon, that it has no power, no structure, uh, no uh, authority without it. All of those deeds are only backed by the system of capitalism, global capitalism, that they're in opposition to along cultural Newton conflicts because that they have no reason to uh, which no person they cannot would express a real uh, rejection of capitalism uh, they're just because they are, are a product of
one. Chase them. <laughs>
uh, hostile and uh, uh, narcissistic songs uh, that weirdly over rely on cheesy uh, sound effects. Uh, William Joe William Joel is about the only contemporary like, uh, songwriter of any note popular in popular culture to, you know, before hip hop, I guess, to consistently put little sound effects in his songs, like making literal the fucking content of the song, like uh, moving out with the room, room at the end, or there's one where the TV starts. Like, dude, come on, man, people. It's a song. People know what's happening. It's so funny because you'd think it would make his work specifically and exclusively, or I mean uh, specifically suitable to the, uh, what do you call it, uh, the, oh, damn it, uh, to the jukebox musical, that's what I was thinking. And there was a Billy Joel jukebox musical called Moving Out, uh, Twyla Tharp did the choreography, and I believe it was a one-season flop, which is, like I said, amazing, because his songs, are very, uh, many of them are stories. Uh, he loves f- people like them with that kind of, you know, uh, theater, uh, 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 theater style elements, theatrical elements. I kind of wonder, I mean, I never saw it, obviously, but I kind of wonder if it flopped in part because... Any protagonist? Like, imagine the main character in a play where he's got to sing Billy Joel songs like every 10 minutes. Imagine what an absolute fucking douchebag that character would be. Every, every song by Billy Joel is somebody saying, Fuck you. I'm cool. You suck. Or trying to exculpate himself or demand something of someone else. Don't go changing to try to save me. Oh, if that's what you call moving on, well, I'm moving on. Hey, good luck in the suburbs. Uh, Here I am at the piano, and they're asking me, man, what are you doing here? It's like, god damn, this guy's a fucking smug, hostile prick. And I'm assuming the characters, uh, the main character in the show was as well. I don't know. Probably never going to see it, but whatever. Some of the songs are still pretty goddamn catchy. Okay. Have I talked to you guys about the white noise thing yet? Because I really think this is really interesting. So if you guys know anything about the movie biz, right now one of the hottest uh, power couples in in creative end of Hollywood is Noah Baumbach, uh, 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 Felix's least favorite director, uh, and uh, uh, Greta Gerwig, his uh, younger female uh, paramour. Uh, it's funny. Noah Baumbach is is like the dark Alexander Payne for Felix because Felix loves Alexander Payne and he hates Baumbach. And I honestly think part of the reason comes down to the fact that Baumbach is actually Jewish and uh, Alexander Payne is a Midwestern Greek guy, which means he's ki- basically Jewish in that his relationship to like uh, uh, mid mid America milieu is like similarly alienated, but it's not quite the same thing, which means. For, you know, someone who's immersed in Jewishness their whole life, less maybe annoying. Uh, so anyway, he hates Baumbach. But, so Baumbach has been making these Netflix movies for a while now. He's, he's, he's on the creative end of the Lost Leader Ledger for Netflix. We've got Baumbach, the guy who made, you know, movies like, uh, like Margaret at the Wedding and The Squid and the Whale. Middle Brown, middle brown classics at the very tail end of uh, independent theater as a concept. Everybody's makes and in those early days, he was married to uh, you know, celebrated and talented actress Jennifer Jason uh, Lee. Uh, but they had an affair, I believe in part because he cheated on her with Greta Gerwig. If not, he cheated on her with somebody for sure. Uh, and then he ended up making a movie about a marriage story uh, and hooking up with Greta Gerwig. And together they collaborated on a couple of movies. She's like his younger protege. Uh, and also... Uh, wife, I guess, or girlfriend, I don't know. But so they were both uh, indie people, you know, who came out of those those moderate budgeted movies that uh, existed on the margins Why of the big, you big own uh, commercial studios. And yes, we're meant, you. you know, God will you own make enough product? money for investors, all, but we're not supposed to be huge uh, ledger items. Can but of course, that whole economy has been swamped by forever. quantitative easing more just than anything. Imagine. 
one commercial deal. We talk about at the end of last week about expenses, how uh, the, the, the final t- uh, t- uh, time it fix to the crisis of capitalism Others now is in quantitative so easing from the you. Federal Reserve. So what's and what that means is now there's so much money circulating sure that to do profits have to be massive to justify investments. Well, and help. because investments are massive, because there's nowhere else to put it. So it's just laundering through the system. So these guys all get squashed out. But, so he got to enjoy sort of the apogee of that. Like I said, right Squid in the Whale, Margo at the, at the wedding. No these movies played in theaters. No I went and saw them in the theaters. Right uh, they, they were talked about and by uh, cognigency and literati. The girl with Younger, of course, comes in a little later. She gets a few of those before she ends up getting swallowed by the same economy here. And so I honestly, I think because gender plays a role, but also the generational thing, Baumbach had longer to establish his name as like a brand. They are now both at the two ends of the stick of like uh, the creative in Hollywood now, the, the the filmmaker, at least. Uh, film runner, show runner, whatever, or, uh, so we you're a filmmaker with any kind of clout in the industry. And true you, your choices are you can make shit on internet. Netflix so, that will never get, get seen by or talked about, talk, seen by anyone or talked about by anyone. Some people will watch it while they're on their phones or fully laundry. They might tweet about it a little bit. It might get a little bit of mean rubbage. But that conversational, the thing you went into it for basically, to be someone that people talk about. You know, the the next time that fuels the egos of filmmakers, that's gone. But they'll give you creative freedom because they're just signing checks. They're just an algorithm that's making decisions. You don't have studio executives and people thinking that they actually have a role. And of course, creatives hate those people, but we know now from the Netflix example that Attention, some homeowners. pushback we want to requires filmmakers to with this get roof more of the ingenious future. and to Watch this like, important look at their message film now and for more address details. it critically in a way that Theory they wouldn't Metal otherwise. Is looking and makes, for in general, to the for better styles and colors of our next generation metal roofing system, system. Left and right. our next generation uh, metal roofing system something, is backed some by a lifetime warranty and can be installed in as little as eight hours. Now Baumbach is over there like could fucking be Colonel Kurtz having spent $140 million on an adaptation of White Noise, which is a movie that takes Don't place entirely uh, in and around a fucking college campus roofing. in the Midwest. Click the link at the bottom of this video now and enter your zip code to see if you qualify. So that is where you end up. You end up in the creative weeds trying to hack something out of just this big blob of money on a streaming service. You can never have or outlets, if you're a little late to the game and maybe today. a woman, uh, you are... If you're Greta Gerwig, uh, you get to make a s- smart, thoughtful, uh, you know, subversive, actually, version of Barbie. You get to do IP for a studio. Those are your two options. That's, that's where you get to go. There's no other place. Like the best case scenario now is not that you get to make a movie and then you have people see it and have every step of that process part of a careful, deliberative uh, winnowing into, you know, the highest, the highest amount of clarity of purpose and meaning. Person. Instead, it's, like, it's people I just is, drowning in a yeah. sea of money. Put it out in a shot against like, the best. Or uh, it's uh, the spirit you of Shinzo being creatively hero, strangled Taylor. by <laughs> the IP shackles that are required to get anything else made for any significant uh, outside of the streaming economy. And of life. course, the Bond right, deal should, is uh, running out. Wrap it He's up probably going to be one of the last guys to get that deal. The Bond, they're, they're closing, they're pissed, they're caught. Twenty-eight days ago, a revolution threw out the government and brought in the new
call them in the fucking dogs for this shit. Uh, um, because they're finally cranking down on the money supply. They're finally applying some fucking... Uh, they're applying some... Uh, friction to the market. The they're they're tapping the brakes a little bit. And so the first things that are going to get stress tested are these things where there's not even any theoretical money, where it's just a built technology uh, and capacity play, where our profit is out the window, which is only possible because of quantitative easing and applies to things like Netflix and fucking. Um, Netflix more than anything, but also like and Lyft and stuff, those guys are in trouble. It's Tesla, right. they had to sell their Bitcoin and at loss to show uh, positive me. cash flow and for the quarter, run. which is a big IRA, IRA raiser. Uh, but the most vulnerable of all is Netflix because it doesn't really have anything. All oh, it's, it's, it's value add now. Hey, we're going to create this thing it's now been absorbed by people who have IP like Disney or Warner's, uh, tech like uh, Amazon, or uh, it just meant it basically a domination of the personal computing space in such a way that their profit flows elsewhere are such that they can throw money down that hole further. Because uh, I don't know how many people know this, but for the last decade or so, uh, uh, Apple has just been sitting on a trillion of do- trillions of dollars that they can't settle anywhere. Because there's no way that it'll be worth it to put in an investment versus what they're going to cost in taxes. And so they're just looking for places to write out money, and Apple Plus is part of that. So they're going to be able to hang around forever. But Netflix has nothing. They frantically spend billions of dollars to build a big catalog, but they're just so far behind. exist 
and it must be directed towards capitalism's ends, which is very easy because organized crime accumulates people who care about money. And therefore, they could be socially organized along a class interest that is basically uh, orthogonal to, you know, uh, the legal classes. And they'll do what you need to do. They'll do the stuff that can't be done in a democracy. And that's a big part of the Irishman is, is the relationship with the Teamsters and the way that they warped the labor movement and maybe killed Kennedy. We are live. Why are people saying we're not live? 